let's get this session started then. Um, next up, we have Tennessee Leuvenrock. Um, he started coding like probably before I was born, like before the internet exists. <laughs> um, well, no, okay. Well, anyway. Um, <laughs> Uh, he does enjoy th having the internet around these days, though. Um, and yeah, he went from being a help desk operator over all, through all the different stages of development and, and software engineer over to having his own team he's managing these days. He's going to talk to us about syntax hijacking and if this is genius or evil, I'll leave the decision up to you after the talk. But give him a uh, warm welcome. All right, thank, thank you everyone. Due to the fact I was still hacking on code for this last night, I've given it absolutely no run through preparation at all. I would generally expect this to be a chaotic roller coaster ride of demonstrations and fun. Um, so I'm going get to into, get into my introductions. I've also, for the first time, not had any slides. I've just got po Python notebooks, which means that the entire code's on, everything's on GitHub, everything executes, everything works, um, nothing is sensible. So you can go through there. So here are my rules. So well-intentioned heckling questions and comments, go for your life. Uh, questions that are not questions. I am fine with questions that are not questions. I don't understand why people don't like questions that are not questions. Feel free to ask questions that are not questions. Um, tweet, tweet, go nuts. The only no's are getting genuinely angry with me or with other people. So you know, keep it classy. So, uh, I've, so some people like the whole crowd participation thing. I'm fine with it. I'm not monitoring Twitter. Um, but what we're going to do is if I demonstrate something that you think the rest of the world should definitely not do, give it a minus two. If you think that the rest of the world should actually do it, give it a plus two. Uh, and if you're just kind of like, hey, that was fun, or I'm not so sure about it, give it a plus, a plus one or a minus one. And you know, we'll, we won't do anything with the data at all, because I don't have time. But there it is. So. <laughs> So, there's, so what is syntax hijacking? So Python lets you change a lot of its default behavior, OK? And the Zen of Python tells us there should be one and only one way to do it. And, and that's not obvious unless you're Dutch. Now, I am half Dutch. So what I'm going for is being halfway dangerous. That's, so, so there's bits of Python that you own, OK? We should all know that we own what goes in methods. That's what most people do most of the time. You also own what happens when you use the square brackets. And that's, people do that much less, but like most people are vaguely aware they can control what happens when you use the square brackets. And then there's the bits of Python you can steal. So a little bit of basic wizardry at first. OK, so I'm going to import some spells. So what do you think this statement will do? OK. No, no, we're starting easy. <laughs> OK, now, so, so just to, to help the audience along, all of the wizardry is contained in the spells. What do you think this one's going to do? Prince what do you, seven. Prince seven, all right. Oh. You're close, close. If, if you round up, Pete, Peter got it right. All right, so hang on, let, let's just try that again. Oh, wait, that's different. OK, OK, now I'm going to cast a different spell. What do you think this one's going to do? Five? I am now an aeroplane. <laughs> OK, so a lot, of, a lot of this talk is going to be based on duck typing. I figure this cat is trying really hard uh, to, to do its duck typing. Now, duck typing is where if it smells like a duck and it quacks like a duck. Wait, no, sounds like a duck and quacks like a duck. It's a duck. So, so that's what you can use uh, to exploit some of Python's gaps and weaknesses. So, for example, suppose I've got this dictionary of values that I copy and pasted off Wikipedia, and I want to get the first index. Wait, that points to the number two. Now, we all know that this is wrong. Clearly, the, the one should point at the one. That, that's how this should work. And, and, so if you, and the minus one is, is also wrong. The minus one is the six, but it should be minus one. Clearly, clearly. So this is, this is wrong. So we're going to fix Python. OK. so. And there we go, right? OK, so, so standard indexing, but, but it's fixed. OK, so if you want to know how, how to fix Python, you can go and get into the source code for the libraries that, that do all of this. Um, now, 
Yeah, there's a few. What I'm not going to tell you is the like, like the cheaty bits where this only works when you call it in a particular way, because then it would, would look less impressive. But there's a reason that it's in a, like, it turns out, like, if it's in a dictionary, I can, like, steal this from the, from the, the locals and then, like, add what's in the dictionary, but I can't actually write back the locals to out of, so there's gaps. So there's a lot of wizardry you can do, which is, like, pretty hilarious. Um, so here we go, like just to prove that like I'm not pulling the same. So what I did up, up earlier was I changed what print was doing. So I can, I can get in there and use mocking to change what the built-in print function does. But just in case you think that's what I'm doing here, I'm not. I really, really have, even, even outside of the spell, I've actually gone through and, and changed the adjustment of how the indexing works. So that's a basic example of the kind of wizardry you can do in Python. Now, that this is probably all a bit evil. Like th there's, like the, the, the difference in indexing, I'm like, well, if you have some like maybe external library that's somehow one indexed, like you're calling a Fortran code and it's one indexed, like maybe actually doing something like this could conceivably make sense so that your index semantics lined up, maybe. Okay, so like I can kind of justify that one. Um, but I definitely can't justify changing what print statement does, and I definitely can't justify bringing cats up in your operational code. Okay, okay, so sorting. So sorting's one of the, the classic examples. So this is like where I think it's, it's like a good idea. This is what it's supposed to be for. Okay, so if we've got a list and it's not in order and we sort it, it comes back in order of the numbers. Okay, but if we have playing cards, you know, five of hearts, six of hearts, six of spades, Ordering is not just numerical anymore. There's a, a, an additional um, aspect. So if I've got, here I've got a couple of hands of cards. I've got a short hand of cards and a long hand of cards. If I sort my short hand of cards, you know, it's coming in, coming in numerical order, sure, and then it's ordering these according to the, suit, the sort order. So I haven't had to, like, call playing cards dot sort or, like, you know, understand the, the semantics. I'm just using the, the, the completely standard Python function for doing the sorting. But if I want to play a different game, like 500, well, it's got a different suit, suit order. So 500, now what you'll see is that the, the hearts and the spades have, have flipped. Okay, so we're still using the standard Python language, but I've been able to tell my class what its semantics are supposed to be, but I haven't had to tell the programmer a new way to sort. So maybe that's a little bit magical because but at the same time, if you, you know you're playing a particular game, um, you, you can use that to say, well, this deck of cards now relates to this particular set of game semantics, but the actual programmer doesn't need to relearn how to sort a list. Okay. Uh, and then we go back to bridge, which is the standard mode, and there it is. Uh, so this is interesting. So this is random mode. Um, so what's going on here is that it's, it starts with a number and then it breaks ties by going into the suit based on a specified suit order. Now, I can randomize that suit order and then I can sort it by a randomized suit. Now, this is, this is a little bit evil, but now you see we have, now it's just disordered. I, I, it, it's hard to explain why I added random into the good example. <laughs> but, but I did. Okay, so, <laughs> so there you go. Okay, so like, like if you're gonna try to like change the greater than and the less than, like probably make it deterministic. So, so I, that, that's, why I, that's why I did it, that, now, I, now I remember. So, the, the, so what, are the, what are the constraints you have to respect? Okay, so it's a bit like, you know, if you're gonna change some concept like this, you need to understand what it is you've gotta respect when you're doing it. Like it is fine to implement greater than, re-implement greater than and less than, but if it was a, a more complex example and you didn't realize that you were violating the determinism of greater than and less than, then you might get yourself into hot, hot, hot water. Okay, so that was, that, that's, just, that's just the warm up act. Okay, so, all right, so now we're gonna be talking about some books because everyone, everyone reads books, right? So we're gonna read three books and, and in fact they're poems, but by the time I realized I was gonna use poems instead of books, I was way too far down into implementation. So, these are books, so I'm gonna learn these books, and then I'm just gonna like pull out something, Zen, Peter's, like whatever, okay? So just give me what I meant, okay? And here we go, look, the Zen of Python by Tim, Tim Peters, that, that's, that's what I meant. So that's interesting. So the square brackets are usually used for selection, so it's not really complicated to go, oh yeah, he's like pulling something out, but it's, 
it's fuzzy, right? Like there, there, there may have been similar books that it's chosen between, you know. Is this a good idea or a bad idea? Like should square bracket selection return like one well-defined deterministic thing out of, you know, like if I'm pulling out of a dictionary, like there's a hash function, I'm getting that exact thing that I put in there before. I know that if I get the same thing twice, the same thing's gonna come back. You know, like I actually kind of quite like this sort of fuzzy search concept. But it worries me, because if I added something else to the list that was like, I don't know, that was like similar, but like maybe, maybe more directly relevant to the search term, I might get something out that was different. So I, I'm not sure whether this is genius or evil. I'm not, I think it's, it's kind of neat anyway. So yeah, I can get Jabberwocky, so that's great. I've asked for Zen and Jabberwocky. It makes a call and goes, well, Jabberwocky is longer than Zen. So he typed that pretty deliberately. So I think we'll go with Jabberwocky. Um, if I go for Raven Po, so I, I haven't spelled it correctly at all, and I've got out the, the Raven by a Gale and Po. So that's pretty good. So we're doing some pretty decent, like fuzzy intention matching here. And if I go for like Raven Po Bible, it goes like, look, that guy was clearly drunk when he wrote that search term. This is probably what he wants. So, so there's a measure of like intention guessing going on there. Um, and just because this is no longer so much about that, but this is like what's actually happening. So like this is kind of where I was about four days ago. I'm like, I've had this idea that we should have fuzzy, fuzzy getting, but now I'm gonna have to implement like all of how to do a fuzzy search. So this is a random now aside, this is how to implement fuzzy search in Python. Okay, so, uh, okay, what's going on here? So there's a thing called, the, we started with a thing called the Levenstein distance which is like called the edit distance, which is like how many characters are difference between the two. Um, and then I've got a particular function that will take me from like, you know, if I have like two edits, like it'll map it back to a number between zero and one. But, so this is what this tan h function is. And there's a few different ways to, to do that. So like, I, I'm like, oh, it doesn't give me enough kind of, hang on, I'm pointing at my screen, that's silly. So it doesn't give me like enough sort of resolution. So like here I've got, where are the axes on there? They're on my screen, this is ridiculous. Okay, so, okay, so now I can get scores between like minus five and plus five and get some kind of useful number between zero and one and any worse than that, you're just kind of horrible and it, it's either perfect or, or not very good. So if you've ever got something like this where you need to like take some kind of, you know, like, uh, specific value difference between two things and then like use it in some kind of matching system and this is on three so this is now now way more scaled and all, brilliant okay I can get up to you know six to eight characters apart and be able to reasonably discriminate the quality of a match on those things and away we go okay so then we take that and then like here's a, here's a bunch of examples for a whole bunch of different words and you can see that yeah, so like things that are very, like the number of edits, what sort of number comes back for, for how, how bad of a typo it was. So this is, this is what I've actually implemented under the hood. So it takes the, the words that you ended up, you put in for title and author, splits them up by string, sorts them by the quality of this match. Um, so it starts with like the search term and then sorts the other list by the quality of the match with the first element and so forth, pair, uh, iteratively or down the way, and then uses even more maths to work out which one of those represents kind of the closest match. And like that actually worked pretty well. Now I've got three reasonably well discriminated examples, um, but hey, this is a talk, not a career. So I'm just stopping there. Okay, so graph wizardry. So this was, so number four was where I started. Okay, so this is some more syntax hijacking. So I've got this, this wizard graph. Now anyone who's seen a lot of graph definitions knows often it's like fairly verbose. So this is about the most brief syntax I've ever seen for declaring a graph. So you've just, you, you make one, and then you make your node function, and then you just use the arrows. So like, you know, that's an arrow, A points to B, A points to C, and we are done. Okay, so that is, that is my, this is my graphing library, it's not complete, but I think it's awesome. And there you go, yeah, so plus two, yeah, I'm like, I think I just like invented a better graph syntax, I, I, you know, so I think this was good. Okay, and then we got some plotting, and then now, when you're not in the, in the with statement, it doesn't 
change it. You just get true or false. So you can also use this to query your graph afterwards. So you can use like the with so the context manager to like modify your graph. So it's mutable inside the, the context there. Here it's immutable. So you can still just use the arrows. Does A point at B? Yes. Okay. Does B point at A? No, B does not point at A. Okay, job done. Uh, and then we can bring our, our context manager back in, add a few more things, plot a more complicated graph, but I didn't like these plots. So like I know I've kind of demonstrated the point around like you can do the syntax thing, but like it just wasn't pretty enough. So I just had to keep going. So this is the same code, still awesome graph syntax. Um, and then like this one, you can plot, drop it out to like a, a DSL and you can draw it and it's got like, I think that's better drawing. Okay, so there we go. So we can draw it better and then we can draw the more complicated one and there's the bi-directional thing. So that's the equals equals. So I'm like, yeah, the, that, that's bi-directional, that's single directional and that's a much better plotting library. So oh, that, was, that was a relief. Think, things should look good. And if you print it, you get, so you can print it or draw it. So the, you see the printing is just like, it just represents it out to a string. I don't have to call like dot two string or is it dot string or is it dot dump string. You just use the Python syntax and just there it is, it's fine. And you can just pipe that out to a file if you want to. And you don't need a whole lot of extra semantics around complicated, uh, this is what all my class semantics are. So I, I, this was one I thought was good. Okay, so. How am I going for time? I'm actually doing all right for time. Okay, so now, now we get into some text wizardry. This is text generation. So, um, all right, so I've got this chunking class and I'm going to create this chunk. Now this chunk means that from like midday till 3 p.m. the temperature will vary between 14 and 15 degrees. So if we look at that, oh, it says, it, it, it says words. That's cool. So we can use this for text generation. Now, you don't even need the wrapper. Just there it is, that's how it is. So then we've got C2. Okay, now who can tell me what's interesting about the next statement? Okay, so this is where I think that Python is wrong again. So it's not really, I'm just being ridiculous. Um, so normally if you'd add like three and nine, you'd get the same thing as if you got nine and three, because that's how maths works. It's not how strings work. They are in a specific order. If you add C1 and AND, different things happen to if you add AND and C1. Not only are the words in a different order, but a different object add method is getting called in both instances. So if I pull the wrapper off C2, all right, uh, and all right, who, who's got an idea of what might happen now? Syntax error, there we go, invalid syntax, exactly. That's because a C2 knows how to add a string, but a string doesn't know how to add a C2. And I don't, oh, damn it. All right, okay, still an error. This one is now caused by the thing that I was talking about. We, we, <laughs> at least I was able to reproduce it. Um, so yeah, that, that's where like the string, so, so C1 and AND add up together and give you the string which is from up there and the AND. But then the string doesn't know how to add a, an instance of C2. And I don't, I, this may just be me, but I don't know how to tell the string to know how to add. Like I need like a, an if added concept. I like, you know, I need to like know how to tell a string that it is act like, the thing over there does know how to be a string really and it's fine to give a string back, but I kind of understand that the people who implemented Python didn't really decide to like make their string class like, <laughs> no way, <laughs> that's just ridiculous. Okay, uh, I, will, I will stop ranting about that particular thing because I'm, do I'm doing a silly thing and I know it. Okay, um, so I can create a multi-chunk out of those two things and I go, I haven't put a lot of effort into the, the niceness of the words, but here we go, now we've got a chunk out of two bits, and it says, well, this thing will happen, and then this other thing will happen. Um, I no. Right-hand add, so you have ah. on the right. Cool, there's a way. If only, I'd, if only I'd known you three days ago, Nick. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so, so this is where I've done a little different thing with, like, I can make a chunk that's, 
indicating a sequence, which is like that happens and then that happens. But this one where I add them, I've actually used an addition concept. So the times have been added together and the new max temperature is based on the, the max out of each of the two. So if I'd had, say, another like two months full time to work on the talk, I could have implemented a really powerful text generation thing and you could see how you could add all of these chunks together and take, take something, anything that involves like an aggregation is kind of reasonable to use a plus four um, and, and you can get into these sorts of things. So I went, I just, because I've done text generation before, I just kept going further and further down the text generation rabbit hole. Um, okay, so if I have 24 hours, it stops being quite so readable. So let's, let's like look at a graph of what's supposed to happen there. So that's the, the, the track of this hypothetical daily temperature. Um, but again, I just, I, I don't like writing that much code, so I just told my class how to, how to do it. And then I gave it this dumb chunk method, which chunks it up into four bits, and, and away we go. So then what we've done is I've used behind the hood, the same kind of class can be like one thing or multiple things. It's effectively a tree. Um, and there we go. So it now gives you the maximum temperature in chunks per day. Now, I've only got five minutes left, which means I get to gloss over everything that's happening for the next few minutes. Um, OK, so then I implement an error function on this. So now what I need to do is take these time series and go, well, what is the best possible chunking that is going to best discriminate my times of day? And I feel like I've kind of changed topic now. It's no longer syntax hijacking as like how to deal with things that are more than one type. Like there's a piece of data, something that's being represented, and you need an elegant way of working, working with them. Um, so I've got this error method. So the error is like the integral of the difference between the maximum temperature per hour and the actual maximum temperature of the aggregated thing that's being represented. And I didn't know enough plotting magic to be able to draw that. Um, and I didn't have enough time to take a photograph of a napkin either. So you either followed or you didn't. But I have implemented a smart chunk. And so the smart chunk results in this particular thing here. So this, uh, ignore that little white gap. I also don't have enough plotting skills to make little white gaps not appear. But I did, know what I, meant, I did know what I meant to achieve. So what we've got here is that this minimizes, and now I can just like draw with a finger. So there's sort of, you know, that's kind of the temperature and then it starts raising up. And the idea is that it's minimizing the area of blue above that max line by considering every possible split of the hourly temperatures along the way. And then if I just, print that, then even though the, the text is still not very great English, this is a, an int a far more readable, you know, sort of sequence of the words that are going on. And I was tempted, but didn't, to instead of having this smart chunk thing be there, just go, you just, you just sort it. So you can just go like C2 equals sorted of C but I didn't implement that. So one of the things we could do there is possibly override the concept of sorting to just like general improvement. So you could say, <laughs> <laughs> so, so like if you go, well, well, a sorted list is like just kind of better than an unsorted list. Well, error minimization is, is a lot like sorting. I mean, <laughs> and just betterness is a lot like that kind of improvement. So I feel like you can take some of these concepts and, and, and use them for your own purposes. Now, the, the, whether your developers will thank you for this is, is highly variable. Mine didn't. Um, <laughs> uh, but I, I remain convinced that this has, has value in some particular context. But uh, I, I leave no judgment about what those specifically are. Um, that brings me to the end, end of the slides uh, as such. Um, if you want to, there's the wizardry library. If anyone wants to pull the graph implementation out and uh, start a graph project, I think there's, there's possibly legs in it. Um, and feel free to add more wizardry to the wizardry library with pull requests and who knows where we'll be in a year. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Tennessee. As a token of, the, of appreciation, we have this coffee mug for you. Thank you for Thank you. the talk. Um, do you take questions? Uh, I do take questions. Then we have a few minutes. Um, let's have a, somebody from a non-common um, group uh, give a first question, please. Like, 
non male, white, young, like not me and people like me. <laughs> Oh, that backfired. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then, yeah. So have you, so have you actually convinced anyone? <laughs> <laughs> have you actually convinced anyone to use this? No, well, I, I haven't. <laughs> uh, I, I had. Well, uh, this is just like a kind of like 10-year-old case of sour grapes, right? So, so the bo the basis of the the text generation stuff, I did some things like that at work, and we were faced with this question of do we go down the using as much of a Pythonic, like what was a Pythonic approach, but we had developers from like all sorts of different backgrounds, and so it was like easier to come together on a set of class and object semantics than it was on what the definition of Pythonic really meant anyway. Um, so you will face that, um, but I think, but, but, one of the things that can be good to do is remember that like being able to print an object is really useful. Being able to get re represent data in more than one way is really useful. Um, so, but no, no one's ever used it. Uh, and we go up. We go. Um, I really like the graph uh, idea. I think that that does have legs. Um, I was also thinking, could you go back to that syntax? Uh, which one? The graph the, syntax. The graph. Yeah. I'll show you the pretty one. <laughs> oh, hang on, there it is. Because I'm thinking we could use square bracket slicing to find paths and... Oh, that'd be brilliant. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here on Monday and Tuesday, let's just make it happen. <laughs> um, I know this is like your third or maybe even fourth talk. Are you just collecting mugs? Like how many do you have now? <laughs> The, the, this is my this is my second talk at this particular conference. Oh, okay. um, th this this I do love my mugs. Every year there's a mug photo at the end of the conference. Um, but th this talk was became very special to me over the last sort of three or four days while I madly attempted to implement as much as much strange functionality as I could. I wish I'd given myself longer. If you're going to use this technique with your own types uh, and not just for fun but for serious work. What help is there for making sure that your implementations uh, obey the relevant laws like totality, associativity, total order in the case of ordering? Yeah, I think you need to find someone who knows about those things to write your test rig for you, essentially. So yeah, ma make sure you run it through a bunch of total ordering tests. Um, if you're going to use that kind of thing, make sure you've implemented it so that things like sorting don't explode. So you're going to need to understand what those constraints are. Like that, that, that is the hard side of all of this, is like, like the graph thing doesn't particularly like break any constraints as such. Yeah, I'm reusing the, the thing, but it's clearly within the, that context manager, and I don't have to like magically call graph.make mutable and change the definition of everything, and then like remember to undo that when I'm finished. So I think there's a few ways where if you're gonna do it, you can make it more convenient to people. I think that the, the context manager syntax is amazingly powerful and underused in general. So even if you don't use it to do weird things, using it to go, this is setup code I want to have happen every time, this is boilerplate that has to happen at the end and really get to the business logic is actually incredibly valuable. Um, and being able to push back, you can, you can abstract things and write wrapper libraries for things is a perfectly reasonable thing to do um, and let you push you know, oddities of creating connections to servers and credential passing and things like that to, you know, you could just go like with my favorite server brackets name and have something know how to sort of manage all the credential side of that so the developer's not confronted with this just like wall of setup when they're looking at the code. So it really does help to bring the business logic of what you're trying to achieve to the fore. All right. Thanks, Tennessee. There is a 10-minute...